to talk about something interesting. This video addresses topics of disability and prejudice. It is made with respect. Earlier in life, I worked as a lifeguard and a swim coach at a local pool in a small town. We taught swim lessons to adults and toddlers and all ages in between. Well, one summer we were hired to give swim lessons to a group of fairly severely intellectually disabled teenagers. These were young people at the start of their adulthoods who had pretty clearly struggled to be able to survive on their own without daily help. Most had very limited communicative abilities, and some were entirely incapable of speech. We taught these kids as best we could, but more often than not, their motor skills failed to keep them afloat, and our instructions failed to reach them. Each lesson turned into more of a communal bath that helped them ease their somewhat justified fear of the water. I'll always remember when one particularly panicked young man, nonverbal, started losing control of himself. I attempted to sing to calm him down. To my surprise, it worked instantly. The Beatles, it was, and me who had barely stumbled through Beatles rock band vocals. He tapped his fingers to his lips once I finished, a gesture begging for another verse. I learned later that it's not uncommon for people of his disposition to quite enjoy music, even if he'll never be able to sing it. I still think about those teens sometimes. I wonder what they're doing now long grown physically, but still needing the constant attention that a child would. I hope they're getting by. I wonder if they're contributing to society. You might have some understandable moral apprehension, probably bordering on disgust, at comparing intellectually disabled teenagers to brainless zombies. I'll say up front that I, making this video, and Mappa, making Tai Yamada, do so with intent, and one that is clearly explored in Tae's time with Fran Shushu. Let's put our emotions aside for a brief pause and consider the metaphor further. Why do we see monsters as monsters, as evil and unwanted? Well, because they're dangerous. They can harm us, you may say. But our fellow humans are far more dangerous and harmful than anything in nature. Cars and heart disease harm us orders of magnitude more, but we don't constantly live in fear of driving or of hamburgers. Instead, consider the cost of monsters. We must devote resources and attention to controlling and fighting the monster. They require other people to stop what they are doing and hunt them down. We judge them by how much they're able to grab our everyday society and rattle it. How much they threaten the collective good. Inversely, we give praise to leaders and scientists, heroes and artists and philanthropists for how much collective good they provide to society, even if they create some harm along the way. This is the metric, how much a person takes from society, how much they give back. This is a fairly basic societal benchmark, perhaps the most basic, that lets humans establish social rules that form the basis of all civilizations. From hunter-gatherers having to pull their weight for the tribe lest they face ostracization, to contestants on Survivor having to pull their weight for the tribe or facing dismissal. Humans were and are always social creatures. Now the reason that you're likely offended by the comparison from before is you want to naively believe that the intellectually disabled aren't that much of a burden to those around them. But yet two minutes of talking with any caregiver for such a person would tell you that's not at all the case. Perhaps you don't want to think about it, understandably. It's a complete understatement to say that it's a lot of effort put into caring and managing for someone for their entire life. But unlike raising a child, there's functionally no outcome where this person will ever contribute meaningfully to the society that paid, figuratively and literally, to keep them alive. And that futility is harrowing. And it contrasts with the self-evident moral good to help those in need. Spending your life caring for the needy, that's just a massive opportunity cost of a life. Caregivers for the disabled often experience this as stress, burnout, and guilt. 
There are support groups and many, many stories about how difficult it can be. So you can see why, throughout human history, the disabled and infirm have been an afterthought, if they're even thought about at all, treated as subhuman, or, well, monstrous. In Saga, it's very clear to everyone that Tae is a pain in the ass. Her feral nature means that the other seven people she lives with have to constantly struggle to maintain her social acceptability within the group and when performing. She requires additional attention from everyone around her for far less reward than she gives back. She can, and absolutely does, inflict physical violence on others for little or no reason, and even if it's played for laughs. Even her extended relationships get annoyed at her after interacting even briefly. She is someone that society would rather not engage with. That they would rather forget about a monster that ostensibly offers nothing to society. I'll also briefly mention here that while we look at this from a Western lens, East Asian societies are substantially different when it comes to the concepts of an individual's obligation to give back to society and not impose on others. This drastically affects their perception of the disabled, but it's mostly outside of the scope of our purview here. All of this considered, it's but a simple skip into a nihilistic slide. Honestly, what good am I to society? Honestly. Really, I sit here alone in my house all day. I make a video on some pop culture dalliance that maybe, if I'm lucky, a thousand people will listen to and forget about. I call my widowed mother maybe once a month, if that. Sometimes I'll play video or board games with acquaintances or post a meme on Twitter, but I'm no one special, with no loves tied to my name. I can care for myself, sure, pay for my food with labor, but... Just like those kids, and just like Taie, I give functionally nothing back to society. I certainly am not legendary. Isn't that actually the case for Sakura and Junko and I? The impulse then would be to disconnect, to reject the onus that all alive or undead must contribute to society, to retreat into one's ostracization and embrace that outsider role, perhaps even attack the very society that mandates conformity and- <laughs> Zombieland Saga is a story about misfits, about the state of being a misfit, a criminal, a failure, a prostitute, an otherwise undesirable person whose society is so quick to label as a leech, a monster, or even just a nobody with nothing particular to offer, with no legend to their name, a story of social refuse who should, by all rights, be vilified and opposed to their society, who are ironically and impossibly asked to somehow not only contribute, but to go beyond, to revive and inspire the same society that wouldn't and didn't think twice about throwing them away. Monsters, you see, can't be idols. Idols is just as nebulous a term as monster. Ostensibly, they're antonyms, but they've both been worked into meaninglessness in anime and J-pop culture. But if the most endless genre of anime idols prove anything at all, it's that there's no set path to being worshipped or lauded. The best anyone can ever do to give back to society is, frankly, try. Honest effort, we like to believe, will never go unnoticed. And so it goes. Somewhere along the line, Tai's value to Franchushu and to Saga punches out from six feet under to walk again. Somehow, the handicapped, shambling zombie rises up to become a cultural star who earns her worth to society, actively engaging with others and providing value for them. Because she does not, as the more neurologically active idols do, ever check out. Taie never once shows any signs of struggling with worthlessness. Every task she is engaged to the extent of her limited capabilities, every interaction she participates in wholeheartedly. It is very clear to all, be they viewers or her fellow squadmates, she enjoys being an idol. 
And even when her teammates falter again and again, burdened by the realization of the impossibility of their task and the sheer pointlessness of it all, it's Tae who's either too stupid or too passionate about their task to refuse to let the rest of Fran Shushu disconnect, check out, or become a monster. There are glimpses of intentionality, ever so faint in her actions. There are hidden talents that would never have been given the light of day had she not been engaged. Talent for finding the beat flows into an improvised percussion session later on, and then a full-on drum solo. Even her inabilities ironically flip into selling points, including her chicken-based rivalry and her clumsy cuteness. She clearly does care for her community and her friends, and does follow Kotaro's quixotic vision for Saga. By the time she has her triumph in Franchushu's live concert, leading the crowd in a growl-based parody of Freddie Mercury's Live Aid performance, Number Zero has succeeded. She's paradoxically become not only worth far more to society than what she drains from it, but she's inspired a region. She's inspired the other idols. Without speaking literally a single word, and with all the baggage that her disability brings in full view, she's become not only a contributor to society, but a leader of it. The message I took away from Tai Yamada is not some equality speech mandate. She clearly cannot do things others can, and the pain she inflicts around those around her because of her condition is never marginalized or overlooked. I think it's disingenuous to ignore that or bandage over it. I defend and will continue to defend the legendary Tai Yamada because she willed her way into being a part of her world and her society, despite and in spite of what she lacks, Tae was given an incredibly unique chance to be an idol that is already largely impossible in the best cases. For an unknown bit of misfits and monsters in the ass end of nowhere, it's nearly inconceivable. Tae, more than any of her peers, took that chance and embraced it, made it happen with a dint of her will. The necromancy that left her without her wits and the disability it presents was just one shambling step along the way.